Over the Christmas period, I picked up this um, game for my PlayStation, um, Atari 50, which is a sort of interactive history of the Atari games consoles. Misses out the ST, tut, 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 but the Atari games consoles and arcade games. And one of the things it does is it emulates the game so you can actually play them. There's been a new Jaguar emulator written by Richard Whitehouse, which has then been released for the PC as well. And so I thought what would be an interesting thing to do would be to actually look at how we would write an emulator for a game system or a computer or anything really. First thing to start is to actually we need to know what's in the system that we want to emulate. We're not going to build a complete emulator because we don't do tutorials on computer file, but we'll look at the things. So let's start with a system and let's keep the Atari theme. So let's grab a 2600. Start off thinking, oh, it'd be really hard to write an emulator. Then when you actually start looking at it, you think, actually, this is really easy. And then when you try and actually make it work for every single bit of software that's ever been written for it, you realize it was hard in the first place. So you can get something going that will run simple software quite easily, but to get the most out of things like the 2600 or an Amiga or an Atari ST or whatever it is, even a modern PC, um, lots of software tricks are often used and getting them to emulate accurately can be really, really hard. And that's where things get interesting. But let's break this open, literally, and see where we get started. There we go. So there's not much in it, case. Um, and then we've got the circuit board and most of this is just stuff to make it appear on the TV screen. So we've got the TV modulator over here, a few buttons for input and output, sockets for the joysticks on the back, a few switches. That's power input, quite useful, doesn't work without it. But the main things that we're interested in if we're trying to build an emulator are these three chips here. The one in the middle, uh, this one is the CPU. It's a variant of the 6502 CPU. So we'll need to emulate that. And by emulate, I mean we'll need to write software which does exactly the same thing that the CPU does when given the same code. Um, this one over here is the wonderfully named Riot chip. That's short for RAM, input, output, and timers uh, chip here. And we'll need to emulate that as well. And we've got down here the television interface adapter, the TIA chip, which is one that produces the graphics and so on that actually gets displayed on screen. Of course, the other thing, which the games are comp uh, the Atari is well known for, is that you have the cartridges which you slot in here. And actually, all the cartridge was, was a ROM chip which contained the program. So your actual program code was in the cartridge, so that was there. And then the CPU was here, and the RAM was in the chip here. The guy actually, and you had the wonderfully high amount of 128 bytes of memory. We're not going to go into the details of how the 2600 works. That's a, another video. Uh, we should probably already covered part of it. But we need to know where those things were. So that when we em emulate the CPU and we write a particular memory location or read from a particular memory location, we know whether we're getting data from the cartridge, getting data from the RAM and the riot chip, or whether we're accessing some of the hardware that's attached to it. So the first thing that we need to know when building an emulator is What's the memory like? This is pretty much exactly the same things you need to know when designing a computer or designing a games call in the first place. You need to know where things are going to be so you can build the hardware to decode it. We're not building hardware, we're writing software, but we need to do the same sort of thing in there. The software to pretend it's hardware. It? Exactly, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're writing software that pretends it's hardware. So on the 2600, we have address zero down at the bottom. We have FF, FF up here. Yes, I know the 6507 CPU variant in the 2600 only has a limited number of address pins, so it only goes up to one FFF. But in terms of the 6502, it's still trying to access the high addresses to fetch things like the reset vector. We'll come back to that. So at the top, we would have the ROM, and that would be a line, so the top of it is a FFF, F, um, so that the reset vector and things are in the right place. So the lower 128 bytes of that are for the TIA chip, and you access that with those addresses. The next 128 bytes are your RAM, 128 bytes of it, and then at address 2000 or so in hex, you have the rest of the Riot chip that you can access there. So we now know where things are in memory, and we can relatively easily duplicate that in a program. The ROM cartridge, if we've got the code for it, we can load that into an array and we can access the bytes from that relatively easily. Again, the RAM, we can load that into an array 
access the bytes, write bytes into that when we access memory there. Easy to do. As we said, when you start off, it looks complex. As you start to break it down, it starts to look, oh, this looks relatively easily. One array, two arrays, easy to implement. Then it starts to get harder again. For things like the input-output devices, the TIA, the Riot, your keyboard, your mouse, if you're doing a computer or something, they're not necessarily memory locations, but when the CPU reads from there, you can write software that basically says, if it is this location, call this routine to process the value that's being written or call this routine to produce the value that's being read from that location. So the memory side of things starts off looking straightforward. The other thing we then need to implement is, of course, our CPU. And then that's normally in hardware, we'd talk to the memory via a data bus and an address bus. So the address bus would contain the address of what it wanted to access and the data will be funneled over the data bus. As we said, we can emulate that. Our emulation of the CPU can produce an address and then we can then fetch it or store it based on the data that we want to access. So the question is, the real question is, how do we emulate the CPU? Well, to do that, we need to understand how the CPU works. We need to understand what registers it has, what internal values it has where we can store things. We need to know what it does when it starts up. We need to know what the instructions are and the effect that they have. And then we can write a program that does exactly the same thing. So let's have a think about the 6502 CPU. And the only reason we're using that is because it's dead simple. Um, that's based inside the 2600 or something. Um, it's also inside the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, the SNES used a later variation of it, the 658C16, I think it was, um, and so on. And the 6502 has been around for donkey's years. PET, the Commodore 64, the BBC Micro, or 6502 based, if I remember correctly, um, or variants of it, should we say, uh, and things. So the 6502 base CPUs are dead simple. We've got three registers, A, X, and Y, and they all store eight bits. So we've got an eight bit for that, we've got eight bits for that, and we've got eight bits for that. We also have a stack pointer, which we will call S, which is also eight bits long. But the 6502 does something slightly bizarre in that it always prepends a one to it. So your address is all four between one zero zero and one FF in hexadecimal in memory, which maps quite nicely to our display here because our RAM starts from FF down to seven F, but the way it's implemented is it also appears at one zero zero to one FF. So you can use the RAM both for just general purpose things and also for the stack, which you need for the CPU to work properly. Things like calling a subroutine will only work if the CPU's got a stack for that to store the return address in uh, and things. Just the way the CPU works. When you call a procedure effectively, it needs to store where to go back to and it does that by putting it on the stack so that you can then pull it off when it's finished. Again, it's starting to get slightly complicated because we thought these things only appeared here but actually they now appear at the same thing. So there's two addresses that can access the same thing. So we need to write our software that emulates the memory to cope with both set of addresses and get the same thing because if you access them at either value, you get the same result. Starts to get slightly more complicated. Still not that complicated yet. We'll come to that. So we've got our AXY, we've got our stack pointer, which is one and then the value in there. We have a program counter and this is 16 bits long I'm here, and that stores the address of the next instruction we're going to execute. The CPU works by fetching an instruction from memory, executing it, then fetching the next one, and it knows where to get it from based on the program counter. Here, so that's a 16-bit value. And then finally, we have a set of processor flags, which are generally referred to as P, um, which are 8 bits long, and depending on the instructions, they get set with specific values. So we can break these down. For example, we have a flag n, which is set if the instruction produces a negative result. So if you say subtract one number from another and it's negative, that bit in the practices of flags will get set to say that it's produced a negative result. There's another one which is set if it produces a zero result. Um, there's one that happens if there's an overflow, a carry. I'm not writing these in the right order. There's one that tells it if there's Interrupts enabled, there's another one that tells it if it's in decimal mode, which is a pain in the neck to implement. And then there's one that tells it if the break has happened. 
course, you need to make sure if you're implementing it that they're in the right order. So that's basically the internal state of the 6502 CPU. It is relatively straightforward. And we could easily write a program to store this state. We could have a variable called A, which stores the value in the A register. We could have a, va a variable called, what do you think, Sean? Uh, well, I would have called it B, but they've called it Y. So, uh, is it Y? No, it's X. So yeah, we'll have a variable called X to store the X register, a variable called Y to store the Y register, a variable called S, which stores the stack pointer, a variable called PC, which is 16 bits long, which stores the program counter, and a variable called P, which can store the processor flux. So again, relatively straightforward. We can create these, just use normal variables to implement them. Then we need to think about what does the CPU do when it starts up. With a 6502, what it says happens is no idea what's going to be in the registers, except it will go and fetch into the program counter from memory locations FFFC and FFFD. So it'll fetch those two bytes and put them in the program counter as the first address it's going to access, which is why our ROM cartridges are mapped in at the very top of memory, because then those addresses are in the ROM and the ROM can specify where it wants to start its program in there in the games console. And so when we write our program, the first thing that we'd want to do is to set the program counter to equal the location in memory at address 0xffc. Oops, I missed an F in there. And then we just need to do some bit shifting to get the location at 0xffd. It's a little engine CPU. Hate little engine CPUs. Big engine's the way to go. Um, I'm a Motorola fan. And we'll shift it left eight bits to get it into the right place. So we fetched the address of the first instruction. We are emulating what the CPU do. The hardware that implements it here, when it comes out of reset, when it starts, will take the address that's in memory, which will be in the ROM cartridge on this system, on a different computer system will be in a different place, gets the address there, puts it into the program counter, and then goes and fetches the first instruction. So what our program would need to do, and we'll write this in pseudocode, is fetch instruction at PC. So we fetch the byte that's there on the 6502, the instructions are a byte long on different CPUs, they're different widths. If you're trying to emulate the x86 CPU, uh, Good luck to you. They're an absolute nightmare. They can be anything from one to 15 bytes long. Pain in the neck to emulate. So we can fetch the instruction there. And um, that gives us what's called the op code. We then increment the program counter so that it's pointing at the next instruction. We then need to emulate that particular instruction. And the way we can do that is look at the op code. And then if the op code has value zero, we'll do one instruction. If it has its value, one, we'd do a different instruction. If it has value two, we would do another instruction. So we could use something like a, a switch statement and just say switch zero, do this, switch one, do that, switch two, do this, to have the same effect as the CPU would have when that instruction is executed. So let's have a look at a very simple instruction. This one has the value A9, which if you were to look at up in the instruction is the load A register with an immediate value, which just means it follows it in memory. So if we saw the value of A9, we would then write some code that would read the next value from memory, which we've already incremented the program counter to point to. So we'd read that, and then we would take it and write it into our variable A. One other thing we need to do is we have these flags that we would need to set based on the value of the variable A. So, for example, if this is 65, it's not negative, so we'd set that to be false. It's not zero, so we'd set that to be false. And because of the way that LDA is specified in the documentation for the 6502, we don't change any of the other flags in the flags register, in the status register. So what we'd have to do for every instruction is write a piece of code that would do the same thing for A, X, Y, S, P, C, and P that the CPU would do. And as long as it has the same effect, when we then execute the next instruction, because the state's been updated to have the same thing that the hardware would have, that instruction will have the same effect. Now you might think, there's 256 values in a byte, that means I'm gonna to have to implement 256 routines. Actually, it's not quite as bad as that, because a lot of the 
um, instructions are similar. So for example, the one we've got here, the A9 routine, we can actually break down to a set of bits that end one zero, and then you have three bits, we'll call them B, here, which specify how the addressing mode works, and we'll have three bits A here that specify what the instruction is. So these three bits will tell you how to fetch the value from memory. Is it an immediate value? Do you read it from another memory location? And these will tell you what do you do with that value. So it might be, in this case, LDA, which means we load the accumulator, the A register, with it. It might be that we add the value onto the A register, or we subtract the value, or so on. So actually, you can split this down and say, well, I need to write eight different routines that do the actual operation, and eight routines that fetch the value from memory. And then, so actually, it's only 16 routines you have to write, not what looks like it might be 64. So it's not quite as bad as it seems, and some of the other ones will have similar effects as you do that. So it starts to look like writing it wouldn't be too hard. But we've only considered the CPU and what it's executing. Remember we said that the CPU is actually talking to the other chips on the system. So it's talking to the riot chip and it's talking to the television interface adapter to cause things to appear on the screen, to access the joysticks and so on, to know what you're doing uh, as you're playing the game. And this is where things become more complicated because each of these instructions takes a certain amount of time to execute. And the hardware is doing things that takes a certain amount of time to execute. If you go back and watch the video where I looked at how you wrote software for the 2600, one of the things you had to do was change the registers in the television interface adapter at exactly the right point as it was traveling across the television screen to change color, to set things up to appear on the right point in the right line. If you don't get the timing right, it'll be at a different point to where the television interface adapter is, and so it'll have a different effect as what appears on screen. It might execute the right code, but what appears on screen wouldn't be what you'd expect it to be. So you actually have to write the code here and the code that emulates the television interface adapter or any other hardware in your system so that you get them working at the same speed that they're in lockstep if you want to get exactly the same effect. Now for something like a games console that's really important so that the games work fine. If you're just wanting to run a program um, say something like a word processor, it's probably less important. You could probably write an emulator for, say, a BBC Micro that could run a word processor, run basic, um, without worrying about that. You could provide the data when you got to it, which key's been pressed, for example. You could output the data onto the screen and display it, and it would work fine for something like that because it's not so tightly coupled between the timing and things. But when you get to things like gaming um, and sort of you're talking to other bits of hardware and so on, then you really have to make sure that the timing is absolutely right. And that's where things get interesting because something like the 6502 is relatively straightforward in terms of typing. If you look at something like the 68000, which was using the Amiga or the Atari ST or the Sega games, uh, Sega Mega Drive, Sega Genesis uh, and things, you find that the length of time an instruction takes can depend, depending on the way the hardware is built, on the instructions that are next to it um, the way the hardware is implemented means that some instructions may take longer at certain times than at others. Um, on the Amiga, for example, if the CPU could be stalled while the hard graphics hardware fetch values in certain cases uh, and so on. And so you had to really make sure that everything's balanced. What this means is that even though you're emulating a CPU, which is perhaps 1 megahertz on something like this, 8 megahertz on an Atari ST or Amiga, say, is relatively low spec, the actual CPU power you need in the computer that's running the emulator can be considerably higher because you have to make sure each of these things are happening in the right amount of time so that they appear on screen at the right amount of time and everything's happening and it can get a lot more complicated very quickly. As we said, you can create a very simple emulator relatively straightforwardly. All you have to do is make sure the right values end up in the registers and in memory at the right time. But to actually then emulate a more complicated system, it gets quite complicated quite quickly. And often these things aren't documented. So often you will have to sort of write tests that run on the real hardware, assume you can get access to it, um, that test and find out how things actually work out in practice.
because sometimes the documentation is wrong, sometimes the designers of games and things have pushed this so far that they're beyond what the actual um, hardware designers expected things to do. So some of the things you end up trying to emulate are specified, the CPU and things, but actually the way that interacts with the other bits of hardware, some of it's documented and some of it is just sort of a byproduct of the way things have been built. And to make sure the software has exactly the same effect in the emulator as it would on the real hardware, you need to make sure that those same side effects happen often at the same point in time. And that's how writing an emulator becomes more and more complicated. You have to do tests to find out how the hardware actually works in practice rather than just the way it looks like it should work. And you need to keep all the different parts of the hardware synchronized. Not necessarily in terms of real time, but certainly in terms of in relation to each other. So if the real hardware takes this long to display a line of graphics on screen and the CPU executes that many instructions in that same amount of time, then your emulator needs to emulate that number of instructions in the same amount of time it takes the graphics emulate, emulation to display those things. And so you need to keep track of how many cycles it's often referred to each instruction takes place with, and then you can advance the graphics by the same amount and so on as you're going through. Even if you're writing a simple emulator though, there are certain things you need to keep track of. For example, on the Apple M1 Max, the Mac OS running on there can emulate an x86-64 CPU very effectively, um, but even there, they've had to be careful because the memory model of an ARM CPU is different from an x86 CPU. What I mean by that is x86 has certain design decisions made, which means that in this case, this will happen, particularly if you have multiple threads running alongside each other, there's a strict ordering of when memory will get written back, which the ARM CPU doesn't implement. So if you're emulating an x86 CPU on an ARM CPU, you have to make sure that you also emulate that memory ordering and things in there. So you can get something going relatively quickly that emulates a CPU, but to get it totally accurate, you often have to really delve deeply into how the hardware actually works and then implement that in your software. Maybe it's going to work for 90% of the internet or 80% of the internet, but it's going to die for the other 10 or 20%. This is the ossification problem. Chance of getting the train within three cycles, and then if you go any longer, then it's going to take you longer. You know, you'll. you'll...